All right, welcome back. I just wanted to take a little look at what I think is a very important period in history, and that's the time of Attila the Hun. But before I start, I wanted to clear up a few things. Uh, some of my videos seem not to be playing on the BitChute channel, and I'm not sure what's going on there. I've contacted them, but I don't get any, any answers from them. So you can find those same videos at other places on YouTube, Rumble, and also on the website truthtransfusion.com. So I wonder what's going on with that, what BitChute is doing. There are some accusations that they're not all up front, and it seems like they are trying to stifle good messages on their channel. And also, I'm sorry that the uh, playlists I had mentioned on the BitChute channel are not working. I had not completely set those up. They are working now, so you can find them. And again, I highly recommend those. Uh, one is the teachings of William Finley, and another is the Handbook of the Edomite Question. And I highly recommend those. Okay, now with that cleared up, I want to take a look at what I think is a very misunderstood period. And I think that most historians are just parroting what they're taught and that this period has been disguised and a lot of things have been covered up. So I'll just uh, bring up my main point is that Attila the Hun was not this Asiatic Mongol type warrior that had come into Europe and threatened to destroy Western civilization. But in fact, Attila the Hun was a Germanic king. He was not Asian at all. He was right there in Germany and the other point is that the Germanic tribes were not these unsophisticated, crude, ignorant, uneducated barbarians who were just wandering in to the civilized Roman world, but they were actually in a monumental struggle with the Roman Empire and a battle of worldviews, values, and a way of life, and that the destruction of the Roman Empire was actually a highly orchestrated attack which went over centuries and culminated in the Battle of Shalon in June of 451 AD. This was also known as the Battle of the Catalonian Fields and the Battle of the Moriac Plains. And this took place near the city of Troy in northern France. So if this is true that Attila and the Huns were not actually Mongol-type warriors from the Far East, but were in fact a Germanic tribe and Attila was a Germanic king, you have to wonder why this has been covered up and why this story has been twisted. And I have to admit that I've repeated the same things, just like most everybody else, about this period. But if you do accept that this has been changed and altered from the real story, you might see the real purpose here. And I would say that the real struggle was with the Germanic worldview and Roman Catholicism. It wasn't even really a battle against the Roman Empire per se. It was a battle against the Roman Catholicism that had taken over the Roman Empire. And to be more specific, I'll go further and say that the essence of Roman Catholicism was the teachings of Paul, the Pauline doctrines and the Catholic form of the Trinity. And another form of Christianity was struggling against this. This was the Arian Christianity and many of the Germanic tribes had already adopted the Aryan form of Christianity. Even Attila the Hun himself might have been an Aryan Christian. And a key point here is that when the Germanic worldview and the Germanic system failed in Europe, or at least was driven back, one of the main reasons was that there was disunity in the Germanic tribes. They couldn't all agree. There was a lot of quarreling and squibbling and it may have been that if the Aryan Christianity had won out and the Germanic tribes had held to that, they might have been able to defeat Roman Catholicism. And I say that that would have meant that the true Christianity would have prevailed in Europe. So it appears that what really happened at that time was just a civil war in the Germanic tribes, tribes fighting against other tribes. And behind it all, orchestrating events, was none other than a Jewish elite. And they, in fact, were behind Roman Catholicism and had created and used the doctrines of Paul 
to subvert Christianity, to actually weaken it and eventually destroy it, and also to destroy the Germanic worldview, which interestingly enough was very similar to Christianity, and I can go into that in some other study, but what we see really is just a division. It's the same old divide and conquer tactic. And there are some events that you can see that have been recorded in various forms that seem to indicate this. And just to uh, bring out some of the details in all of this, the, uh, the name Hun could actually come from a German word, Hunna, which means giant. Uh, also figuratively means a tall man or a strong man. Now I know some will say, oh, uh-oh, the, were the Huns the Nephilim? Were they the giants of old? No, actually, it, you, it could mean just mighty man or strong man. And um, actually in the Bible, there were mighty men that fought for King David, the Giborim, and also even some angels were mighty men. So it may have that meaning and not as like one of the fallen angels or the Nephilim. Even the name Attila has clearly been shown to be just a Gothic form of the word father and the Gothic language is just a branch of the Germanic languages. But doubt has been cast on this and you can see how other theories have crept in saying it's more of a Sarmatian or Iranian pot or even a uh, Asian Chinese word but this all just seems to cover up the truth. And as for Attila, some have traced him to the region of Westphalia in northwestern Germany, and that he was a very powerful king of the tribe of the Huns, who were not Asiatic at all again. And he was about to take over Europe. You can see how powerful he was in the historical records. And one of the main sources that we have, which has almost all the information about him personally, is from Priscus, who was an ambassador to the Hun court. And actually the only known personal description of Attila was from Priscus. All the others were just based on his account. And it's not even certain that Priscus actually met Attila either. But the idea that Attila was this uh, Mongol type comes from that description, but that has been cast into doubt. And it appears that what uh, fomented the final struggle, the final major battle, was the succession of two little-known leaders in Gaul who were supposedly from the Frankish tribes, a branch of the Germanic tribes, and this was a man named Claudio, who was probably the father of Merovic, the first Merovingian king. That, that was the, uh, the rulers of uh, Gaul after the Roman Empire fell, and the Merovingians took their name from Merovic. But it appears that there were actually two sons of this Claudio, and Merovic the one had been adopted by the Roman general Aetius. And this angered Attila the Hun. I guess he thought he had been betrayed. He had actually adopted the brother, possibly twin brother, of Merovic, son of Claudio. And so this was a succession battle. And what comes out of all this was that the Franks were betraying their Germanic brethren. And the ultimate betrayal came somewhat later when the Franks adopted Roman Catholicism something that has led to the image of the Huns as strange warriors from the Far East is the mercenaries that were in both the Teutonic and the Roman armies. These were the Sarmatians. They were often horse-mounted lancers, very effective in battle. They'd been brought into Europe for centuries. They were related to the Alans, and some settled in Gaul and others as far as Scotland. They had been hired to man Hadrian's Wall. Also, they did originally come from as far east as Iran, the Caspian Sea area, and southern Russia. So they did have somewhat of an eastern aspect about them. I would say that they might have been a branch of the Persians originally. Most would eventually settle in Poland and Russia, 
many settled in Thuringia in eastern Germany. I'm not quite sure why there. It's interesting that Claudio, whose two sons, Merovic and an older son, who might have started the dispute with Attila, which was basically a succession dispute, Claudio may have been Sarmatian and not a Frank at all. And it's also very interesting that Claudio is believed by some to have married none other than a Jewish princess from southern Gaul. The Sarmatians did seem to have some connections to Jews, and many of the Sarmatians may have actually been Khazars, who are also known to be Jews or be connected with Jews. The Jews for many centuries were trading in Gaul, so they had a lot of influence on the Romans and also the Franks there. As a matter of fact, of all the Germanic tribes, the Franks had the most connections with both both Romans and Jews. So in the main decisive battle that finally took place, one side was led by the Roman general Aetius with Visigoth, Burgundian, and Frank allies, and also some Alans. And many of these were most certainly bribed by the Jewish elite to basically betray their Germanic brethren on the other side who were led by Attila the Hun. These would be Ostrogoth, Thuringian, Sarmatian, and some other Germanic allies. The two most powerful forces in the battle were the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. So this was just a division in the whole Gothic nation. The Visigoth king Theodoric was killed in the battle. And this would accomplish the schemes of the Jewish elite to divide the Germanic people and at least drive them back for a time. It's said that Attila the Hun died soon after dejected and uh, hopeless, I guess, is the way it's shown. But there are some that say Attila the Hun actually lived on for many years. He would go back to his home in Westphalia, which was the home of the tribe of the Huns. And also, by the way, it was the home of the Germanic hero Hermann, who defeated the Roman legions at the Teutoburg Forest. This was in the Westphalia region of northwest Germany. The common story is that soon after the battle, Attila married the Germanic princess Ildico, but died on his wedding night of some kind of a nosebleed, which was possibly, possibly brought on by drunken reveling. But it's just amazing that of one of the most important figures of history, very little is actually known. His beginning is obscure. It's not actually certain what his appearance was. There's only one definite source of that, and even this has been brought into question. And the story of his death is very doubtful and shaky. Now there's another source that might provide more information about what happened to Attila and the Huns after the battle and would give a more correct account. And this is the Song of the Nibelungs. Some scholars believe that within this saga there's an actual historical account or remnants of an account, but this has been disguised and covered over in the saga which uh, changes some of the names and places of the events. But Attila is clearly in this story, and in the story he has revenge on the Nibelungs, who are believed by most to actually have been a Burgundian or Frankish family, and that this story is really telling of Attila's revenge on the Franks, the Burgundians, and Visigoths, for fighting on the side of the Roman Empire and Roman Catholicism. The Song of the Nibelungs is most well known in the Wagner operas which borrowed and further fantasized the story. There's another medieval saga from Norway which sheds even more light on the actual account and this is Dietrich's saga or Theodoric's saga and this indicates that the Huns returned to their original home and would reappear in later times as the Vikings. It's also interesting that the Nibelungs who are destroyed in the story were actually a Frankish dynasty who were also connected to the Burgundians and probably Jews and the Jew William Galone. The name Nibelung is eerily similar to Nephilim. The name Nibelung means foggy, misty, shadowy, darkness, cloudy, and this is, uh, could easily be connected to the evil Nephilim. So we get a more clear picture of the struggle between the Germanic world and the Roman Catholic world, not necessarily the Roman world. 
I would add that the Visigoths may not have been simply bribed to fight against their Germanic brethren, but they sincerely may have wanted to preserve the Roman Empire, not necessarily Roman Catholicism. They themselves were Aryan Christians. So you might again wonder why the image of Attila and the Huns was so distorted in history. This uh, could cover up the fact that the Germanic people were much more highly organized than has been taught, and it, it helps to distort the image to show that the Germanic people couldn't even lead themselves. They had to be led by this foreign Mongol Asiatic leader Attila, but then if you see that Attila was actually one of their own, a Germanic king, it changes the whole story and puts the struggle more clearly into light. And again, it appears that the Aryan form of Christianity was the key in unifying the Germanic people and preserving their way of life and customs, even some of the so-called pagan customs. So the Roman Catholic Church and Jewish elite would have to fight vigorously against any movement of what I would say is the true Christianity. And they knew that a unified Germanic people would be their downfall and ultimate end, the, and the end of their worldview but this fight would continue in the Celtic Church with Pelagius and also John Cassian and finally on to the Protestant Reformation and beyond. So I'll just leave it there for now. I'll put some references of books on this subject. So until next time and thanks for listening.